Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church. We're glad to have you all. I'm going to read this morning from the first chapter of Luke. It's rather long. Be through verse 56. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth and under a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seems good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Adi, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren. And they were both now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of innocence, incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when, when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall turn, he turn to the Lord her God. And he shall go before him in the spirit of the life to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed. Because thou believest not in my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had, been a, had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministrations were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art 
highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall be overshadowed thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country, with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a lower vo loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord shall come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of the salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which he told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. And he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless this congregation. We ask that you bless those who are not able to be with us this morning and be with the doctors that they are seeing and help them to see the problems. Be with us this morning as Brick brings the message and help those that this reaches into their heart, into their mind, that they believe. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Larry will now leave us in song.
I invite you to stand with me and let's turn to hymn number 266. 266, Holy Holy. <laughs>
everybody. What a beautiful day in the Ozarks. And what a wonderful day to come together to worship the Lord. We welcome all of you to First Christian Church this morning. Our guests that are with us today, thank you for being here. And uh, those of you that are joining us live stream through Facebook, thank you for joining us today. Or perhaps you have been joining us each week. And we want you to know that uh, we are blessed by that. And we trust that we are a blessing in return. Um, we want to be mindful today of uh, those that are sick and not able to be with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, Mike and uh, Becky Lott will be traveling to St. Louis and she has her physical therapy evaluation, I believe at eight o'clock in the morning. And uh, this is, I believe, the final step uh, in her evaluation before they uh, make a final determination uh, on a transplant. Uh, but we are hopeful uh, of the doors that have been opening, and uh, we are going to pray and trust and believe and support and cheer uh, Becky Ohm as she does her physical therapy tomorrow. We're going to be her cheerleaders, aren't we? And uh, praying that all of that goes well and that the Lord continues uh, to guide the doctors and, and uh, this wonderful family on this journey. Uh, Maxine Franks wanted to be with us today. She is still not feeling well. Uh, she has a doctor's appointment on Tuesday, and so we want to be uh, in uh, prayer for her. Uh, also, Lynn Teckel's sister was involved in an auto accident last week, and uh, I sent out an email on that, and so we want to continue to pray for her. Uh, also continue to pray for Mike Lowe, and uh, all of the others that uh, are in need of God's touch and direction. Um, yesterday, we uh, did a, a funeral service for a very dear friend of mine, and uh, those are, are always difficult, uh, but I would ask that you would continue to pray for the Horseman family as they uh, are in their season of mourning. Um, and... Uh, just all of those needs. Uh, continue to pray for Joe Harris Jr. He is home from the hospital and doing better each day, and we're thankful for that. Uh, but we want to continue to remember him in prayer. If you have a need today, if you would acknowledge it by an uplifted hand, we'll take our cares to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day that you have given us. This is a day that you have made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. We are thankful today for this opportunity to gather together to worship you. And Lord, with one voice today, we want to lift up our praise to you. Lord, we are mindful today of those that are not with us, those that are dealing with health issues and uh, recovering from accidents and Lord, you know uh, each one, and we lift them up to you today, along with all of those needs that were represented by an uplifted hand. Father, we are thankful that as you watch over every sparrow, that you watch over our lives, and that you are um, in tune with, with all of us. And, and Lord, we just pray that you would minister to each need today according to your will and according to your purpose. And Father, as we uh, go through this service today, uh, the remainder of it, we just uh, put it in your hands and ask, Lord, that you would bless our time together today. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. amen. We're going to dismiss our kids, the Sunshine Kids, today. And uh, while they are uh, making their way out of the sanctuary, I want to invite the rest of you to go with me in the word of the Lord to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, while you're turning there, I also want to say thank you to uh, all of you that either uh, reached out by way of Facebook yesterday or maybe a text or uh, a card in the mail. Uh, yesterday was... 
a, uh, a difficult day because first are always difficult. And uh, yesterday was the first anniversary of uh, Becky's mom's passing. And uh, on a day when you're already uh, reminiscing about a sad time in life, uh, to have to uh, also attend the funeral uh, just sort of adds a, a extra layer of grief. Uh, but uh, we, we had a good day. And uh, we got out yesterday afternoon and traveled down where her mom was raised and, and just got to see the beauty of God's creation. If you uh, haven't been out yet, the, the red buds are beautiful, the dogwoods are blooming, and uh, it's just a good time to take a little drive out in the country. Uh, I think we did miss a couple of turns that we probably should have taken, but uh, we'll make up for that sometime later. But, uh, but thank you. Uh, for the love that, that you show to uh, us and to your pastor's wife. And uh, we want you to know that it's very, uh, very much appreciated. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want to draw your attention to that one little line, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And I want to minister this morning on the final chapter. The final chapter. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We are thankful that it is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Lord, we are thankful that within it we find words of hope and words of truth. Today, I pray that you would help me to minister your anointed word. I pray that you would open our hearts to receive it, our ears to hear it. And Father, we will give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. It is impossible to fully understand a story until we have read it all to the very end. Because it is in the final pages that the author pulls all of the loose strands together. It is in those closing chapters that the meaning and the purpose of interwoven narratives and mysteries are explained. If we stop reading too soon, we will never understand the author's intent or appreciate their writing skill. And that is true as well with God, the author of the scriptures that we believe and that we embrace. And it is also true as it pertains to the story of our own lives. You see, we are prone to draw premature conclusions from too limited a reading of our lives. And we really should know better. Because we often see God weaving narratives that make sense only in light of the concluding pages. It's only at the end that we see the work of God and are able to exclaim, Wow, look what the Lord has done. In Genesis chapter 37, Joseph is sold 
And he is enslaved to Midianites who in turn sells him to Potiphar in the land of Egypt. In chapter 39, he is wrongly accused of Potiphar's wife and imprisoned. And if we stop reading the story of Joseph at that chapter, we would think that there was probably no hope for him. That he's probably going to die in an Egyptian prison. But over the next 11 chapters, we see him delivered from his bondage and raised to power in Egypt. We find him saving the lives of his people and preserving the line of Abraham. And when we read the final chapter, we can only say, wow, look what God has done. In the short book of Ruth, we find a woman named Naomi who is bereaved and Ruth who is widowed. We read about them returning to the promised land in great sorrow and much distress. We nod knowingly when we read the words of Naomi that says, Call me bitter, for the Lord hath dealt bitterly with me. If you stop reading, we might think that her story has come to an end. But then we see Boaz enter the story. And he loves Ruth. And he marries her. Ruth then bears a child that she named Obed. And as we keep reading, we find that Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of of David. And if you keep looking at that lineage, you will eventually end up with Jesus. Amazed, we come to the end of the story and we cry out, wow, look what God has done. Another book that bears the name of a woman is the book of Esther. In that book, we find the children of Israel in captivity. And there is a terrible conspiracy to eradicate them. We watch as young Esther is forced to be the bride of a heathen king. Everything seems lost, but keep turning the pages. Esther finds favor in the eyes of the king, and she advocates for her people. And very soon, it was the evil Haman that was behind the conspiracy to eradicate the Jews that is hanging from the gallows. And the Jewish people are celebrating a great deliverance. As we come to the page of the final uh, page of the story, we can only say, wow, look what God did. And that pattern is repeated time and time again throughout the scriptures. Time this morning would not allow us to visit all of the biblical stories that are filled with intrigue and danger and mystery that ultimately culminates in the proverbial happily ever after. 
When we turn to the New Testament, we read the story of Jesus, the Son of God, unjustly arrested, brutally mistreated, horrifically flogged and humiliated. We're invited into the pages to watch in horror as his hands and feet are nailed to a cross. We wince as the spear is plunged into his side. The story takes us to a place of grief as he is lowered from that cross and laid in a tomb. As the skies go dark, so too do our hearts. But the story's not over. On the third day, we enter the tomb with the disciples and we rejoice to find it empty. We celebrated that last week at Easter. Christ has risen. Death could not hold him. And with joy, we read those closing chapters of the gospel and we say, look what God has done. The story continues through the history of the Christian church. The Jewish Christians are driven out of Jerusalem. But as they scatter, they take the gospel with them. Wow. Look what God's done. Paul is thrown into prison, but he finds that his imprisonment actually serves the gospel. Wow. Wow. Look what God did. John is confined to the Isle of Patmos, but it is while he is in exile that he receives the great revelation of Jesus Christ. And we're left to say the only thing we can say, which is, wow, look what God has done. I should have named the message that. <laughs> Turning from scripture to history, we find a 16-year-old British boy kidnapped and enslaved in Ireland. And we might believe that that was the end of his story. But it was during a six-year period of time That he was a herdsman in a strange land. That he consecrated his life to the Lord. And then after escaping his captivity, he later returned to Ireland as an evangelist. Where he preached the gospel and saw many come to believe in Christ. We come to the final chapter of St. Patrick's life and we say, wow, look what God has done. With these stories and so many more, we see the wisdom of reading to the end of the story. We need to read not, not just the introduction, not just the opening chapters, not, not just the rising action and the conflict, but the whole story as it is told from beginning to end. Because it is only at the conclusion that we can even hope to understand the story that God is writing in our lives as the author and the finisher of our faith. All of this is very applicable to our own lives. What we see through the vantage point of time in others helps us to have faith in our own story. 
Because we are sometimes faced with circumstances that seem to mark the final act or the final chapter, the end of the story. Sometimes we encounter providences that make us believe that the book has been closed and that all hope is lost. We encountered this just two weeks ago. At the end of our Palm Sunday service, we had already said our closing prayer and Becky and I were out in the narthex greeting you as you left. When coming down the hall, I saw Amy Harris and she was sobbing, weeping. And all she could say is, we need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray. And I said, what, what in the world is wrong? And she said, my brother has been in an accident. He, he was mowing and a car hit him going 60 miles an hour. And it doesn't look good. And in that moment, fear sets in. In, in that short amount of time, even though it is validated, fear begins to creep in and, and all kinds of scenarios begin to go through our mind and, and we can't help but think this could be the end of his story. I immediately came back to the pulpit and got everybody's attention and we went to prayer. Found out later that he was en route to the trauma center in New Orleans. Broken back. All kind of things going on and it still didn't look good. But I'm glad to tell you today that that wasn't the final chapter. You see, we weren't writing the story. We were just involved in that portion of the story. But God is the author. They say it's not over till the fat lady sings. I don't know why fat ladies got blamed with that. <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, it could have been a fat guy. But I'm telling you today, it's not over till God says it's over. God gets to write the beginning, the middle, and the closing chapter. And there may be things within that narrative that causes us to pause that causes us to think that this is the end. But God is still writing the story. And so when we are pressed, we must not think that we have been crushed. We have to believe that God can still bring about a great redemption. When we are struck down, we must not think that we have been destroyed, but rather have confidence that we are being prepared for a great blessing. When we're emotionally battered, when we're physically spent, that is not the time to determine that we have been abandoned. Rather, we must know that we are being made ready for some great usefulness to God's plans and God's purposes. We have to wait. We have to withhold judgment. We have to wait until the end of our story has been written. For no story, least of all our own, makes sense until we have read to the final page. 
It is then and only then, in light of the whole narrative, that we see the skill, the ability, and the genius of the author. And I know as I preach this today, that everyone in this building and those of you listening to me today through live stream, I know that you identify with what I'm preaching today. Because even though the end of our story has not been written, the end of some of our chapters have been completed. And there have been times in our lives when we didn't know what we were going to do. We didn't know how we were going to make it. We didn't know how we were going to get through that time of challenge. Times when our hope was at the very lowest that it could be. Times when the outlook of our future was bleak and uncertain. And yet because hindsight is always 2020, we stand today and we look back over those chapters in our lives and we can only say, wow, look what God has done. It's because we begin to understand that when we allow Him, He takes the pieces and the brokenness of our lives. And he works them together for good. At the moment that they're broken, we cannot see the beauty in them. But when we place them into the hands of Jesus, he works them together for good. Jeremiah wrote that the Lord knows the plans that he has for you and me. And he tells us that those plans are not to harm us, but to give us hope and a future. The psalmist declares that our steps are ordered of the Lord. That means that every detail of our life is thoughtfully fit together. Each piece complements the other. The bad, the ugly, the difficult are there. And they are there to shine light on the good and to help us appreciate the blessing. And what we do not want to do in our times of challenge is wrestle the pen out of the hand of the author. It is not during times of challenge that we want to try to write the ending. Paul wrote to the Philippian believers and he said, I'm certain that God who began a good work in you will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. That's why we have to trust his wisdom. We have to trust his plan. Don't give up on your story even though the current chapter is one that you would rather not have to experience. Keep reading. Keep turning the pages. Because God always writes a beautiful ending. If we stay faithful, our final chapter is going to end this way. Wow, look what God has done. Amen? Amen.
Gracious Father, we love you today. And we are grateful to you. Lord, so many times we have got ourselves in a mess. So many times we have tried to write our own story. But Lord, how great it is when we surrender the pen back to you and allow you to be the author of our faith that allows you to write into each chapter those things that need to be there. Even though we may not understand it at the time that we're reading it or the time that we're living it, we know that we will look back on it one day and understand that you were working it all together for good. Lord, we go through difficult times in life. We have stories and chapters in, in our lives that are difficult not only to live, but even difficult to look back on. And yet, Lord, when we do, we can say, wow. Every step of the way, the Lord has been with me. You see, Lord, you, you can't go against your word. And your word teaches us that you will be with us always, even to the end of the world. And oftentimes we can find ourselves in difficult situations where we feel all alone. But the fact remains that we're not. There may be moments that you are silent. There may be a moment that you rest the pen. And you do not write the story in a timely manner that we would want. But Lord, as long as we're faithful, we know that it will all work together for our good. And so Lord, today I pray for this congregation. I pray for all of those that are listening today or may hear this later. I don't know what season of life everyone is in. I don't know if they're in the beginning of a new chapter, if they're in the middle of a difficult one, or if they're coming out of a difficult time. But Lord, I know that if we'll look closely, we'll see you in each moment. You are carefully writing the script. Because one day you are going to present your bride unto yourself without spot, without wrinkle, without any such thing. It's going to be a glorious day. And in heaven, we will proclaim, wow, look what God has done. Lord, bless your people today. Keep them in your care. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. amen. And amen. We invite you to join us at the table of the Lord today in communion. If you did not uh, pick up a communion packet when you came in today, if you would raise your hand, one of the elders will be sure to get one to you. Uh, here at First Christian Church, uh, we believe that this is the Lord's table. And if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you are endeavoring to live your life for Him, then you are welcome at His table. The emblems that we use are a wafer and a little bit of juice that recognizes the body of Christ that was given and broken for us and his blood that was shed. We do this because Jesus instituted it during his last meal with his disciples at the time of Passover, just before his crucifixion. He knew what was about to happen. He knew that the end of his earthly chapter was quickly being written. And so for a memorial, Jesus said, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. And with supper being ended on the night he was betrayed, Jesus rose from the table and he took bread. He blessed it. He broke it and gave to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
And in like manner, he took the cup, he blessed it, gave it to his disciples and said, take and drink. This is the blood of the new covenant shed for you. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time at your table today. Lord, this is not just something that we do. It's not just a tradition of the church, but a time of worship. A time for us to be able to remember the price that was paid for our salvation. <coughs> and an opportunity for each one to spend time with you, to give you thanks, not only for your sacrifice, but for the blessings. Even the blessing that is sometimes disguised as a trial, as a test, they all work together to help us to be more like you. Father, I pray today that you would be with your people wherever they may be today, wherever they have gathered or are gathering. I pray your presence would not only be with all of us as we have had this time of worship, but Lord, as we leave this place today, as we go throughout our week, doing all of the things that we are responsible to do, Lord, whether it's in our homes, or whether it's on our jobs, whether it's among family or among friends or among our community. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to live a life that is reflective of you, that others will see Jesus. Father, today we give you praise. We give you thanks. Lord, continue to bless your people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Larry's going to come and lead us in our closing hymn today. We invite you all to join with him in song. Stand with me. Let's turn to hymn number 271, Standing on the Promises, 271.
thankful today that we can stand on the promises of God because they never, ever fail. Amen. You can uh, trust that. Uh, well, I got through today before both candles went out. <laughs> We're making progress. <laughs> Thank you again for coming today. And uh, if you can this afternoon, get out and uh, enjoy this beautiful day. I think uh, according to the weather uh, people, this is supposed to probably be the, the best day of the whole week as far as temperature goes. And uh, so get out this afternoon. Those of you that have boyfriend or girlfriend or uh, you're married to a boyfriend or girlfriend, uh, get out and take a drive and uh, just enjoy the day and enjoy one another and uh, just uh, take in all of the blessings of the Lord. Uh, as we're dismissed today, may God uh, go and be with each and every one of you. And let's pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, Amen. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you.